Hello and welcome to the Mobile Connections FIDO Alliance and GSMA webinar. My name is Tasha Silva and I am the event specialist for the FIDO Alliance. Before we begin the webinar, I would like to point out a few items. This webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded onto our website by the end of this week. Also, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Should you have any questions, please place on the question page pane on the control panel and we will make an effort to answer as many questions as possible at the end of this webinar. I would now, now like to introduce our two panelists for today, Brett McDowell, Executive Director of the FIDO Alliance, and David Pollington, Senior Technology Director of the GSM Association. Thank you. You may now begin, Brett. Thank you, Tasha, and thank you everyone for coming out today. Uh, to learn more about FIDO and FIDO in the mobile ecosystem in particular. I'm going to start us off by going through an overview of the FIDO Alliance, why we, why we were formed, uh, what we do, how FIDO works at a high level, and then we'll turn it over to David who will tell us what a GSM association has been doing with FIDO. So this is why the FIDO Alliance was formed. Data breaches are out of control. Here are just three examples of many headlines over the past year or so. Um, Anthem now says uh, nearly 80 million were affected by their breach. J.P. Morgan Chase, um, the hacking incident affecting 76 million households. And Target uh, reporting uh, nearly 70 million people hit by their data breach. And it goes on and on. Just last year, here are some statistics that we've gathered. Uh, the identity theft report uh, tracked 783 data breaches in 2014. The Wall Street Journal reported on the biggest data breaches uh, since 2002, and they add up to over a billion records lost. And the Pwnman Institute did a study, and of the breaches that they studied, they concluded that it was on average $3.5 million per data breach, the cost to the victim organization. So we have to do something about this. And the biggest culprit in all of this is the mishandling um, of credentials. Primarily, all of the attributes around a password that make it quite difficult to, to use and rely solely on the password for security in this day and age. And we'll talk about some of those properties. And then we'll talk about the approach that FIDO took to introduce something completely different. Passwords. Uh, are difficult for users. They're difficult for users because they have so many of them. So they tend to reuse them across different websites, meaning that they put the most secure website at equal risk to the least secure website um, when they're using the same credential that can be replayed uh, against that most secure website. So it takes the security out of your hands and puts it in the hands of your user uh, because anyone with that password can wield that password. It's what we call a bearer token uh, in InfoSec speak. They're difficult to type, especially on the new mobile screens, not so new mobile screens. So we have a, a greater usability problem than we've ever had before. And they're too vulnerable to all forms of scalable attack, like phishing and key logging and other forms of malware. So for FIDO to do something revolutionary in online authentication, we have to make sure that our design is fundamentally different from these characteristics. Uh, here's one more thing I need to say. Uh, many of you have already tried to roll out additional security measures on top of your passwords. And the state of the art for that, at least in the consumer space and quite often in the enterprise, has been the one-time passcode. The one-time passcode um, that is an extra step for users. And in the consumer space, where uh, so far most of the cases in most of the regions around the world, although not true everywhere, in most cases it's an option for the consumer to turn that on or turn that off. And anecdotally, well, reports from uh, FIDO Alliance members, we believe that largely those options are, if they're turned on, they, they are often turned off. Um, and they're largely rejected by users as extra hassle in the user experience and extra friction. So we have to address this, not just the security side in FIDO. Here are some of the characteristics of the one-time passcode to understand if you're trying to do something fundamentally different. Um, they're often delivered over SMS, so you have reliability issues there, long delays, 
and then of course uh, when you don't have a signal at all. The token necklace problem, typically when you have a, an OTP dedicated device that does not rely on SMS, uh, you have to have one of those dedicated devices for each of your websites. There is some notion of interoperability in the industry, but for the most part, the way the business models work, you tend to roll out a new security token for each site. Um, it's a poor user experience no matter how you look at it because they have to go and find that other code and type it in. The only thing worse than typing in a password is having to type in two passwords, especially when the second one's about to expire on you. And they're still vulnerable to phishing. So where you are seeing increased use of these tokens, like where it's mandated in some financial institutions, uh, especially outside the U.S., um, you're seeing that the cyber criminal uh, assailant is getting quite sophisticated and quite effective. Um, Zeus and related families of, of uh, attack kits are quite effective at stealing these things as well. So the old paradigm was simply, uh, let's do, you get, kind of have a product manager saying, let's roll out uh, the easiest thing for our users to do. Um, and then the security team gets engaged as well, that's too easy for the criminals to do, so we need to add security to that. And you kind of have this trade-off between usability and security. That's the old model. What we need is a new model, and that's what the FIDO, the Fast Identity Online uh, Alliance, has been working on for the past several years and has delivered in the market with the FIDO 1.0 standards going final uh, at the end of 2014. And this is uh, philosophically our approach to the problem. We aim to increase usability as well as security. So this is not about adding more security to your existing system. This is about adding a better user experience that also comes along with better security as something you get in the design of the standards. Now I'm going to say a little bit about how we've achieved this. What's been our approach that makes this fundamentally different from what you had before FIDO? This is the simplest uh, diagram to look at. So instead of the relationship of the secret, the secret that the user can wield to get into a service, being directly between that online service and the user, like typing in a password, instead of that model, FIDO introduces something called the FIDO authenticator, or the device. This is a personal device that the user uses and has in their possession. And what happens is that device performs some level of user verification, um, and then it uses FIDO credentials, not credentials that are um, presented by the user or wielded by the user, but credentials that can only be wielded by the device that was registered with the online service. So essentially, you're using either a secret, like a PIN code, um, to authenticate to your device. Think of uh, all the different ceremonies that are now available for unlocking a device, like a mobile phone. You could be biometric challenges, you know, present your iris, uh, present your fingerprint. It could be a gesture, you know, draw on the screen, the pattern. But that's the user verification piece that's proprietary, innovative, and there, there are new options coming out all the time. And we've created a sort of plug-and-play interoperability standard for how uh, all of those different modalities can be supported by one device. And then there's the FIDO standardized crypto between the device and the online service. Simple uh, public-private key pairs. And now I'll talk about the steps that you go through to register and then use the FIDO uh, crypto standards. So you start on a device. It could be a laptop, a tablet, or a phone. And you have to be in a trusted session. So you bootstrap your registration of your FIDO device by presenting the credentials that you always had before. So if you're logging into an online service, you're probably presenting a username and password, maybe a username, password, and an OTP. Then the online service invites you to register your FIDO device as your new authenticator so you don't have to use uh, the password anymore from that device. Um, or it invites you to replace your second factor authenticator with a FIDO second factor authenticator. But you, the user's choice is to participate in that registration. Step two, they present the evidence, so either they present uh, presence of the second factor authenticator, so here is my second factor authenticator, and here I am as a human actually touching it right now, 
or here's my biometric uh, presence. Uh, I am putting my finger on a fingerprint sensor, or I'm looking at an iris scanner, or I'm speaking my password to a voice authenticator. It could be any of those modalities and many others in step two. So once that uh, user verification step is completed by the FIDO authenticator in step two, what's happening in step three is you're minting a new public-private key pair specific for that account. This is not a master public-private key pair for uh, all services from that device. This is unique for every service that you register. Um, and the private key is stored locally and protected by the authenticator on the device, and only the public key in step four is shared with the online service. So now there's no secret that's been shared with the online service. There's no secret that the user is aware of that they could be challenged uh, and tricked into providing. The only thing that's been shared for the FIDO registration is a public key and information about the device to help that online service make an informed risk decision. Now later, when the user comes back and wants to authenticate to perform some action, uh, they are challenged by the device uh, through the what we call the FIDO challenge that is sent down from the server to the device. Uh, the user has to approve, has to provide evidence uh, that they're the correct user. Again, this could be touching your second factor authenticator, or it could be uh, touching a fingerprint sensor or looking at the uh, camera for an iris recognition or drawing a pattern on the screen, whatever it is. You present that evidence in step two. That gives the FIDO client that, that is running on the local device permission to sign the challenge in step three with the correct private key. So the private key is used to sign the challenge and is sent in step four back to the server. The private key never left the device. No secrets were ever shared with the online service. They just have a signed challenge, which gives them evidence that this is the correct authenticator because uh, the signature validated because they have the public key to validate the signature on the signed challenge. So it's evidence that this is the same device. And based on the device attestation and metadata that the FIDO standards support, they know what the modality of the authenticator is, so they know how much to trust the user verification stage. So whatever that turns out to be, it's ultimately a risk decision by the online service of how much faith to put into what's happening at step two. The takeaway here is that all of the online authentication is occurring with nothing more than public-private key cryptography that's been standardized and proven to work for a long time. FIDO puts interoperability around this and metadata and device attestation to help inform the risk decisions of online service providers. And that is the fundamental shift. And that's what the core vision of FIDO is. Replace these shared secrets with asymmetric cryptography and uh, public-private key signing. We have two uh, specifications to support two primary use cases in FIDO 1.0. The first is replacing the password entirely, which involves the FIDO UAF standards. UAF stands for Universal Authentication Framework. So step one, you're presented with a challenge from the server. Step two, you provide user verification to the FIDO authenticator. So the authenticator must have the ability to perform user verification of some kind. It has to have some kind of secret exchange between the user and the device. And then it does the FIDO signing to get you into your online service. The other use case is not replacing your password, but replacing your second factor or introducing a new second factor for the first time that actually is a delight for users to use. This is the FIDO U2F standards or universal second factor. So here's step one. You provide your username and password. Um, step two. You present presence. Uh, some of the modalities that are already deployed are uh, a small device that would fit into a USB slot, but the FIDO Alliance is also rolling out support for NFC connectivity as well as Bluetooth connectivity for these small devices. And these devices could also be embedded uh, in handsets in the future. But you, you have to provide evidence. Think of this as like a CAPTCHA um, for the user. It's not a biometric authentication, although biometrics could be added on top. So you're providing presence, and now you're giving permission for that U2F authenticator to sign the challenge, and that's how you log in.
So in both cases, the fundamentals are the same. It's public key cryptography. And whether or not there's also uh, user verification to some degree of exchange of secret, like biometrics, that's really what differentiates UEF and U2F. It comes down to what's your use case. And we have standards to support your use case, regardless of, of where you are today on your rollout. Now I'm going to tell you about um, other rollouts that have already occurred. Who has been putting this stuff to test in the field? Uh, PayPal, Alibaba, Samsung, Google, with the support of enabling technologies from Knock Knock Labs, Synaptics, Ubico, PlugUp, and now many others, have rolled out FIDO deployments at scale starting in uh, early 2014. So I'm going to walk you through some of those use cases. And just to say quickly that PayPal, Google, and Samsung, uh, as the large-scale providers that have already invested in FIDO deployments early in the life cycle, back in 2014, they continue to invest and reinvest in FIDO as a core part of their authentication strategy. So now, again, what does FIDO U2F do? What the authenticator is doing in a U2F use case is confirming that the user is present. And then the authenticator turns around when presence has been provided. And by signing the challenge with the correct private key, it is asserting that it's the same authenticator that was registered before. Now let's look at a real world use case. These are screenshots from Google login. So Google, uh, Google accounts and Gmail, as well as uh, recently, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, uh, Google for Work, rolling this out to enterprise. So uh, some of you know that Google recently updated their login screens. So these are slightly older screens. Uh, but it captures the same ceremony that you would likely roll out. Username and password to get started. So once that is complete, you also want to have your device in, uh, installed or handy. Because as a, once your username and password has been accepted, uh, you'll get a challenge like this. It says, you know, please confirm using what they call security key. It says the relying party can uh, describe this any way they want to. They have control of the screen. They have control of the message to the end user. So Google has decided to call this security key. Um, but this is just your FIDO U2F authenticator. So you touch it, and you're in. So instead of going and fighting, uh, finding your six-digit code, on whatever device uh, that would be delivered to, and then trying to type it in, especially trying to type it in before it expires, you simply touch something. Username password, which is probably managed by a password manager anyway, and then you touch something, and you're logged in. So it's a fantastic user experience. And underneath, because of the FIDO crypto standards and how we're leveraging um, other innovations from like IETF, like channel binding, this is not fishable. Now let's look at the use case with FIDO Universal Authentication Framework. What's happening here is the authenticator, is, in addition to having presence, is confirming that this is the same user that enrolled before. So there's some sort of exchange of secret between the authenticator and the user. And then when that evidence has been provided successfully, it turns around and signs the challenge and sends that signed challenge to the server, which is saying the same thing that U2F says. This is the same authenticator that registered before. And we're going to look at some screens of what this looks like uh, in the, when PayPal rolled it out in 2014. So here you're shopping at a website, and you decide to uh, check out using PayPal. PayPal challenges you uh, to authenticate, and because they control the screen, and because they have metadata on the device, they know to ask you to swipe your finger. Then they give you know, confirmation. They're using what we have as an optional uh, transaction confirmation flow here. You know, is, is the ship to correct? Is the amount correct? And then your payment is complete. So it's just that simple. Again, this happens to be a touch, but it could be just looking at something. It could be uh, speaking, whatever your modality. It's much easier and much more secure than anything that came before FIDO. And I have emphasized usability and security up to this point, but I also want to touch on privacy. The FIDO protocols were absolutely designed with privacy by design principles. 
and I'm going to cover uh, some evidence of that. This is basically the rundown of things that we've done uh, around privacy in the FIDO design. There's no third party in the protocol, so there's no one that is sort of watching where you log in. Uh, there are no correlation handles being handed off to a third party. There are no secrets on the server, so you're protected from a uh, breach. So if a breach did occur, they, the assailant would not uh, walk away with credentials that they could use against you in another context. Biometric data, if it's used, never leaves the device. And there's no linkability between services or even accounts on that one service. So you might think that someone designing a system like this would want to have a globally unique identifier on every one of these FIDO authenticators. But we wanted to make sure there was nothing introduced by FIDO that could be used to correlate or link or track user behavior online. So there is no such unique identifier that is given to these authenticators. So in summary, it's better security for online services, it's reduced cost for enterprise through the power of open standards, and it's simpler and safer for consumers. Now I'm going to say a few words about the FIDO Alliance itself. Uh, we are a nonprofit trade association that was formed in uh, 2012 and uh, launched in early 2013. And we have over, well over 180 companies from very diverse sectors. Our scope is very tightly limited. We are only standardizing authentication. We are not tackling the whole identity management stack. We don't work on identity proofing. We don't work on attribute exchanges. There are many other industry initiatives making great strides in those areas. We are addressing the one piece that no other initiative has been addressing so far which is interoperability, authentication, at scale. These are the companies that are currently announced uh, who sit on the board of directors of the FIDO Alliance. What I want to emphasize here is that these are the companies, among the uh, well over 180 in total, who really set the agenda and the strategy for the organization. And we have been recruiting companies to make sure we had good representation across the industry. We have online service providers um, like Google and PayPal, um, MasterCard, Visa, Discover. Uh, we have uh, chip and device manufacturers, Lenovo, Samsung, Oberther, NXP, Crucial Tech. We have biometrics companies with Synaptics and Identity X. Uh, we have enterprise software companies like Knock Knock Labs and RSA, um, and we have uh, U2F uh, specialized manufacturers like Ubico, um, and operating system and platform providers like Microsoft and Google. So we are really trying to cover the broad range of the ecosystem from the supply side to the demand side. So we get all the requirements, and we don't come up with arbitrary requirements that don't stand up to the test of real-world scenarios. That's why what we call the relying parties or the online services are such a very important part of the FIDO Alliance to make sure that what the uh, technology companies are building is something they actually want to deploy, and it's built for their real-world deployment requirements. Uh, a brief overview of our timeline. This is what we've achieved through the end of 2014. We launched the organization with a very small number of members, six members, in early 2013. We introduced a branding program for our members to use to describe their solutions that were based on early draft, not yet final specifications. Then we published our not yet final draft specifications. Uh, about one year after we launched the organization in early 2014. That brought about several deployment announcements from PayPal, Alibaba, and Google throughout the year. And then at the end of last year, we published the final 1.0 specifications for UAF and U2F, both password replacement and OTP replacement use cases. And now I have the pleasure of telling you about what we've been doing so far in 2015. There is a broad range of products that are now available. 
Um, and I will say that the next time you join a webinar or come to a FIDO seminar, uh, this slide here is going to be much, much busier because uh, at the same time we launched this webinar, we also issued a press release announcing the first set of FIDO certified devices. So many of these companies have upgraded from their FIDO ready uh, tested implementations to the new uh, more robust tested FIDO certified implementations just being announced today while we're on this webinar together. So there are many, many companies now with commercially available products, both authenticators, uh, client-side software stacks, and online services and servers for you to integrate in your own infrastructure. Some other news in 2015. Microsoft was the first to make an announcement around FIDO support this year. They, were claim they have uh, asserted that they will support FIDO in Windows 10. And they've also announced that they have something of their own design, their own implementation around biometri biometrics called Windows Hello. So they're offering a new type of biometric way to unlock your Windows device uh, using face or fingerprint uh, readers. And they're also committed to interoperability across the ecosystem with your Android phones and everything else that has FIDO support built in. There are over 1.5 billion users on Windows now. Windows 10 will be in over 190 countries this summer. It's going to, because it's going to be a free upgrade for all consumers, we're anticipating that by the end of this year there will be hundreds of millions of Windows 10 devices that can support FIDO authentication. The next company to make news this year around FIDO support was Qualcomm. Those of you who don't know much about Qualcomm and the ecosystem, they're the, really one of the market leaders in uh, chipsets for handsets. They are accredited with driving uh, over a billion Android devices to, that are in market today. They have over 85 um, original equipment manufacturers as clients, so you might know of three or four or five or six major brands who ship Android devices. Well, Qualcomm supports over 85 of those companies around the world in various markets. And so when they make announcements like this, that they're putting FIDO support into the Snapdragon uh, fingerprint sensor that they announced at Mobile World Congress earlier this year, this is a sea change event for the Android marketplace and other markets that they uh, service with Qualcomm Snapdragon chipsets. We had our first healthcare deployment announced. Uh, this is MedImpact. This is a business-to-business -business use case um, with the potential to reach over 50 million users, both uh, practitioners of healthcare as well as uh, customers of healthcare. Uh, MedImpact may not be a household name, but their customers have the household brands. So they service the insurance companies. And what their first rollout is, uh, using software from Knock Knock Labs and Samsung devices, is allowing doctors to access e-prescription histories, or I should say prescription histories, um, with just a touch of uh, a fingerprint sensor on a Galaxy device. So they can quickly authenticate and access those histories before they make their own prescriptions. Um, and they have many other applications that they plan to add to this and ultimately reach uh, 50 million users with FIDO support. The next announcement came uh, at the week of RSA Security Conference from Google, announcing that they're taking their early success, which was to roll out FIDO U2F to their own employees as a pilot, followed by rolling out FIDO U2F to all of their Google account and Gmail users. They have now rolled out support for Google for Work. The significance of this is that this is instant reach of FIDO authentication capabilities to over 5 million businesses worldwide. Um, and this is what they call security key, but these are the FIDO U2F authenticators that people can use over USB today, very soon over NFC and Bluetooth Low Energy, with complete lifecycle management capabilities provided by Google for Work. And I believe this is the last thing I'll touch on, um, is the interest from governments around the world in FIDO has been growing over the past two years. Uh, earlier this year, the, the White House held a cybersecurity summit at Stanford, which featured quite a, a bit of talk around 
getting the world off of passwords, and FIDO technology was featured quite prominently at this event. And the U.S. government, as well as other governments, have been in conversations with us about how they could be more involved, more directly involved, uh, in the FIDO Alliance, which leads us to an announcement that we have created a new government membership class at FIDO Alliance, reflecting our increased focus on government and the increased focus of governments on us so that now we can collaborate and uh, all the details are available in our new membership agreement which is published on our website. I will leave you with the invitation to join the FIDO Alliance. It's an open organization to any company uh, or now government agency or nonprofit organization who wishes to be involved and provide uh, requirements, use cases, or contribute to designs and solutions of FIDO authentication as we move the world off of passwords and onto a more usable, more secure, and more private way to authenticate. And with that, I'd like to introduce David Pollington. David? Thank you very much, Brett. Um, so yes, yeah, so just a bit of background. Um, I work within the GSM Association. Um, we just go to the next slide, please, Brett. OK, so, the, so what is the GSM Association? So effectively, um, it's very similar to the FIDO Alliance. It's a trade body, it's a non-profit organization, and it represents the majority of the mobile operators worldwide. So there's, there's about 800 different mobile operators that we represent. Um, but equally, we also work quite closely with a number of um, other companies within um, the mobile industry. So um, vendors, people like Qualcomm that you've already heard about, as well as infrastructure vendors, as well as uh, service providers. So really the GSMA acts almost as a, uh, a spokesperson for the mobile industry and we work on a number of initiatives that cut across the mobile industry um, to bring new value to, to consumers and, and to the industry itself. Um, so Mobile Connect is uh, an initiative that we initially kicked off um, back at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona last year. Um, and really it's looking at how we can leverage the mobile device as a means to, for users to authenticate themselves to online services, um, but equally then through that capability to be able to take better control of how their personal data is used and be able to use the mobile phone um, for um, authorizing and providing consent for how information about them is shared with third parties. So first and foremost, um, by using the mobile phone as an authentication factor, it helps to move away from the reliance on the username password credentials um, that Brett was talking about previously. Um, similar again to FIDO, it's uh, one of the cornerstones of the design of Mobile Connect is that it's privacy preserving and it's user centric. So the, the Mobile Connect service itself never provides any identity information to the relying party, to the service provider, unless that information is explicitly requested by the service provider and the, the service the user actually provides consent for that information to be shared. Um, so there's, there's a range of different, so if we just go back one please, Brett. Um, so there's, there's, there's really a range of different um, information that the operators have um, on behalf of the user that can be you know, applied. So looking beyond authentication, there's information around the identity of the user that can be used for things like um, know your customer regulation for um, form filling, as well as um, more sort of dynamic um, attributes associated with the mobile device and the way it's been used on the network that can be used um, within a, a risk management structure to help understand um, any fraudulent behavior associated with a particular transaction. Okay. So, I mean, really, the, 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 the long and short of this is that both Mobile Connect and FIDO really are very similar in terms of the aims and the objectives that they address. Both of them are really trying to move away from the use of knowledge-based authentication, so secrets, shared secrets such as passwords, um, and move towards leveraging the mobile device as an implicit factor of authentication so in order to access a user account, you need to have possession and control of that mobile device. And then with FIDO, you can leverage on, layer on top of that um, a biometric or some other authenticator that's local to the device. 
with Mobile Connect, there could be other authenticators that are leveraging aspects of either the mobile device or the mobile network or the both in combination. So effectively, the, the objectives of both the initiatives align very well, and this is why the GSMA has been working quite closely with the FIDO Alliance since their inception back in 2013. Um, so as I said before, we're both trying to address the same problem, effectively easier, safer online authentication. Um, we're both using the mobile phone to achieve this, um, and whilst Mobile Connect is looking at how it can use existing operator assets, so mobile network operator assets such as um, the SIM, the SIM card, or perhaps SMS. Uh, there's a, another technology called um, USSD, unstructured supplementary service data, that can be used at the signaling layer within the network to provide um, to support an authentication mechanism. Um, you know, FIDO obviously uses the the local device authentication. Um, for being able to provide that capability. But both are providing a very easy, secure, two-factor authentication mechanism. And the other thing which is quite interesting is both are taking a pluggable approach to this. So as Brett was talking about earlier, there are a range of different ways in which a user may choose or be asked to authenticate through their device, whether that's a fingerprint sensor or an iris scan um, or something like entering a PIN or whatever it might be. And it's the same with Mobile Connect. So we've consciously decoupled the provision of the identity service, the federated identity service, from the way in which the user um, is authenticated. And this provides a future-proof mechanism that allows us to expand the range of authenticators um, as they evolve in the marketplace. And this is really where um, the synergies with, with FIDO really come into play. FIDO, as Brett mentioned, is focused um, solely on the authentication, on the, the first mile between the user and the authentication server to provide a very strong and robust and privacy-preserving authentication capability. And that what Mobile Connect is doing is it's, it's also providing authentication capabilities, but it's then providing this federated identity capability northbound to the service provider um, through using the, the OpenID Connect protocol that's standardized by the OpenID Foundation. And through doing that, it, it, it opens up um, a whole range of different services around authentication, identity assertion, attribute sharing, et cetera. Um, okay, next one. So this is where we see the benefit of effectively FIDO um, plugging in to the Mobile Connect framework and providing um, one of those very strong authentication um, mechanisms within the, the Mobile Connect framework. Um, and I think you know the interesting thing, obviously, if we look at biometrics, is that it does move away from the need for knowledge-based um, shared secrets, and it moves towards um, the ability for the users themselves to act as the credential. Um, to provide much more simplicity and convenience in the way that people authenticate to online services. So earlier this year, um, the GSMA and the FIDO Alliance started on a joint initiative um, to look at how the FIDO framework could be incorporated within Mobile Connect to provide um, the, the ability for mobile operators that are launching Mobile Connect services currently to be able to leverage FIDO and use that and for authenticating the user. So we started work jointly on a white paper that looks at how, from a technical perspective, we can perform this integration of FIDO into to Mobile Connect. This was co-developed between ourselves, the GSM Association, the mobile operators, um, and a whole range of FIDO members. It really was a, um, a very good, dynamic, and vibrant discussion and a group that were involved in this. The, the first draft of that white paper has been finished and is just in undergoing internal review both within the FIDO Alliance and the GSMA. Um, but hopefully, if all goes well, we should be able to get that out the door sometime um, by the end of June. So the, um, the, the paper itself focus, focuses just purely on um, UAF, and it focuses on basically how we can integrate FIDO into the Mobile Connect framework. There's other aspects that we've um, slated for a secondary phase of the paper. So one of the opportunities is to use the, 
the UICC. So the SIM card within the mobile device is a hardware secure element that could be used um, for protecting the FIDO keys and um, cryptographic materials. So that's something which we might look at in the future. Um, there's other ways in which um, the SIM card itself could even provide an authentication mechanism within the FIDO framework. So for instance, if you put a Java card applet on the SIM, then that can provide a very secure means of doing things like a, a pin verification that's local to the device and therefore um, abides by all of the principles of FIDO. And also we'll look at how the mobile device more generically could be used within the, the UTF framework. Um, so just as an example of one of the areas that we had to consider within the working group when we were developing the white paper. Um, within the Mobile Connect framework, um, within the OpenID Connect protocol, there is a parameter, um, the authentication context request parameter that allows the service provider to be able to make um, a request in terms of the level of assurance that they would like to see when the user is authenticated. Um, within FIDO is a slightly different approach around the use of FIDO policies that define not only the, um, the authentication level but also the characteristics of the authenticator as Brett was mentioning earlier so that the service provider can then take all of that into consideration when they do their risk analysis um, around a particular authentication attempt. So one of the things that we've been looking at and also working with the OpenID Foundation is really how do we provide this this mapping between use of the ACR parameter within the OpenID Connect protocol and how that could be then used um, with the, the, the FIDO policy framework. Um, so that's an example of, of one of the areas that there's been a lot of discussion and debate um, in terms of how we take that forward. Okay. So next steps. Um, so We'll continue working on the, the white paper, so hopefully the first release, as I said before, will come out in the next month or so. Um, between, the FI, between FIDO um, and between the GSMA and, and some mobile operators, we're starting to prototype um, the technical framework that the white paper um, identifies so that we can actually demonstrate how a FIDO authentication mechanism can be incorporated and used within a wider mobile connect framework. And this is obviously going to be something that's very important going forward and hopefully it's something that we'll be able to demonstrate to people at the Mobile World Congress in Shanghai in the mid of July. Um, and then really after that, the, the aim is to, to step that up and start moving that into commercial deployments. So I think that's all I had from my side. I'll hand back to Brett. Thank you, David. So, Tasha, if you could facilitate uh, the Q&A session, uh, we are now open to take any questions you might have for David or myself. Great. So I do have Great. one question so far. It is, does the FIDO architecture require some type of biometric factor? Uh, no. No, it does not. Neither, uh, well, certainly in FIDO U2F, there's there's no that expectation of a biometric factor being used. Um, although I have, I will say, I believe it was iLock who showed that they could use biometrics as sort of a third factor of unlocking your uh, U2F security key. Um, but even in UAF, where there is a lot of discussion around the use of biometrics for that user verification, there's no requirement that that be biometric. Um, so you could have a, in fact, I think one of the very first proof of concept implementations was just a PIN number, so a local PIN number, a big difference. So the PIN secret would not be living on the server. It's only local, just like your local PIN for device unlock. Um, and that's basically the idea. You know, For a user, their perspective, especially in the mobile use case for uh, a FIDO UAF experience, is whatever I'm doing to unlock my device, oh, now I get to just do that to log into all my sites and services. That's the kind of consumer perspective on FIDO that we're trying to facilitate. Great. Can the FIDO token be used for digital signing? So I, I, I think I lost audio there for a second, but I believe the question was, can the FIDO token be used for digital signing? Correct. 
So if you're talking about e-signature laws around the world and e-signature uh, applications, I just want to separate something. Um, the, 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 a lot of that e-signature um, architecture and policy is around a PKI, so not just public key cryptography, but public key infrastructure. And the PKI architecture does have a third party, the certificate authority uh, in a PKI model. Um, and so what you're doing a lot with, with e-signature is using that you know, X509 certificate to, to assert you know, the identity. So I say that to say this. In FIDO architecture, it's just public-private key pair signing. And I think the right, most useful answer I have for you is that although the e-signature um, programs that are out there are largely based on a slightly different architecture, Certainly the device itself, if you're looking for a device that can do all of this, um, the devices that I'm familiar with that have implemented, let's say, a FIDO U2F in particular, those are secure elements that are designed to operate you know, without drivers and a lot of complexity for the user. And they also support many other kind of like Java applet things that you could put on there. So you could build that uh, e-signature capabilities into that device. But just it would be it would be potentially more coincidence that that device can do FIDO authentication as well as e-signature. Um, that is my not being a expert on e-signature architecture. I think that's the best answer I can offer right now. Thanks. The next question is: Is there a way to synchronize a person's user account over different devices? So can I use my notebook and tablet and phone to access the same online account? So let me talk a bit about um, FIDO device registration as a way of answering that question. Uh, so FIDO 1.0, uh, UAF, and U2F you know, work the same in this regard, that it's a one-to-one -one registration. So each of your personal devices has to register, that registration flow I showed, with each of your online services. So if you start with your phone, and let's say you work with three online services that all support FIDO authentication. So you register that phone three separate times with each of those three separate services. Then you move to your tablet, and now you want to use your tablet uh, with FIDO authentication to those same three services. In FIDO 1.0, you have to register, somehow bootstrap uh, into that, those accounts from your tablet. So you have to register your tablet three more times, just like you registered your phone three times for those three services. And when, I mean, that's working great for 2015 because we're at that point in the adoption curve where there aren't yet a ton of online services that are in live deployment with FIDO authentication. But we're looking ahead to uh, the user experience down the road and trying to avoid that necessity. Uh, we think that that's uh, somewhat brittle. And so one of the things we're working on for the future specifications is the capability for you to leverage the fact that you registered that phone three times on each of those three services. Uh, with, with some sort of secure uh, transaction between your phone and your own tablet that would allow you to then uh, FIDO authenticate on that tablet without re-registering a FIDO authenticator. So look for that capability in the future. Great, thanks. The next question, does Windows 10 support of FIDO mean that websites that want to authenticate users with U2F or UAF will not have to be accessed with the Chrome browser, but with any browser that runs under Windows? What about other apps that run under Windows? Um, so to, let me answer that question by rephrasing it slightly. So when, a, when any particular platform, let's say any operating system, supports FIDO, what, is, what does that mean? for the apps that run on that system or the different browsers that run on that system. So I would first say that right now uh, it's only coincidental 
that Chrome is the only web browser that has native support for the FIDO U2F protocol, which I realize I didn't call out uh, earlier in the presentation, but that's a very important takeaway, that any website uh, can now deploy FIDO U2F support without uh, being concerned about uh, distributing any kind of client-side software because the Chrome browser has that support already in it, if you can presume that your users have access to a Chrome web browser. Uh, but Firefox is adding FIDO U2F right now. There's a, there's a live project. You can see it if you go hunting through the, the projects in their open source um, repository. So soon Firefox will have that support, and I anticipate all the browsers will have that support at some point. So there's nothing magical or special that, you know, that gives Google an exclusive. They just happen to be first to market with that support. Um, so even without the operating system providing uh, native support for FIDO authentication, you're already seeing it in the browser platforms. Now, what will happen when an operating system does have FIDO support out of the box? Uh, what does that mean for interoperability? So we can take the Windows 10 example where we can take um, Samsung's own uh, you know, modified uh, version of Android that they run because they're now shipping FIDO support out of the box uh, without any kind of download required. Um, and in both of those situations, what you have is the ability for uh, any other app that runs on the device, whether it be a browser or something else, is just making platform level API calls like they do for everything else. I want to access the microphone. I want to access the camera. Um, I want to access you know, the FIDO key store. Um, so it's, it's, for example, uh, kind of a well-known situation is uh, developing for iOS and being able to access the keychain, for example. So it, it would, that's what it's going to look like to the developer. Okay, a native API call that I can use for Fido Crypto. Um, and so, yes, you would have interoperability between all the browsers and all the other applications that run on that platform with all of the online services. Uh, now, there, there may be a few months uh, of rollout where um, we have different versions, so people supporting different versions. The FIDO vision about version control, version support, is that servers will have backward compatibility. That's our vision. And we're using the new FIDO certification program that I mentioned was announced today. Uh, we're going to use that program to help uh, drive or inspire uh, ecosystem best practices so that all FIDO servers that are on the market, which you could use to FIDO enable your website or your, app, your remote application, uh, that those uh, implementations will have backwards compatibility for everything that's ever been certified, whether it's UAF, U2F, or any other capability that we standardize. So that's the vision. Um, it's a backwards compatibility from the server side down to all the authenticators in the market. Uh, so I think I've spoken now to what to expect when platforms support FIDO, uh, which is just to recap, interoperability of those applications across that platform and interoperability of those applications with online services through the um, robust uh, omnibus support of FIDO specifications by the server. Thank you. Will the SIM card and other MNO assets be a FIDO authenticator so that service providers who deploy FIDO can use GSMA protocol? Yeah, effectively, yes. So the, there's a number of different ways in which um, the operators can authenticate the user. So within the FIDO framework or, or even outside of the FIDO framework, the SIM card um, is one of the avenues that we're exploring. Um, and you know the benefit of the SIM card is that it is a hardware secure element. Um, when you register things like a PIN on the SIM card, um, that PIN is only ever held on the SIM card. It never goes anywhere else. So it's very secure from a, a privacy perspective um, for the user. Um, so absolutely, yes, that could be a mechanism that's used either within the FIDO framework or, or via the, the, the wider mobile connector federated identity solution. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, how difficult for software engineers is this to implement? Are there code samples? What languages are supported? 
So I'm going to take a shot at that answer, but um, I'm going to redirect whoever asked that question or anyone else interested in the answer to a better resource. So on the phytoalliance.org website, um, uh, I believe you get there through the specifications. If you go down and start looking at specifications overview, there's reference to a public forum that we host called PhytoDev. Um, it's basically a Google group. It's a discussion forum, uh, phyto-dev at phytoalliance.org. And that is a community that we're trying to foster where people can ask each other those questions, share best practices, uh, share libraries that they've been building, uh, open source codes or code examples that they find. So we're trying to start to provide that support to the ecosystem as a trade association. Um, other than that, I've only overheard anecdotes about how quickly some of this stuff was put in place. I was on the phone with someone yesterday uh, who brought up uh, full uh, FIDO U2F support on their server uh, within three weeks at a, at a very large scale deployment. So it, it depends. Your mileage may vary depending on the, the tools you use or the environment that you're trying to FIDO enable. Um, but this is not heavy lifting uh, as compared to a lot of other things that have been introduced around making authentication more robust. Great, thank you. How do you integrate FIDO with SSO slash SAML? SAML. Otherwise known as SAML. Um, so, uh, yeah, so integration is basically where you are making your call, so it's going to be tool specific. Um, but the federation tools made by companies like you know, Ping and Fordrock and, and others those federation tools always have to make uh, provision for how you want to authenticate your users and that you can integrate. It's kind of a, it's a decoupling right now, if you will, that interface of how are they being authenticated. And then there are FIDO servers, which are like appliances that plug in right there. So they, they you can take that FIDO authentication uh, appliance and plug it in uh, if you're not federating, okay, here's how I want to front end my authentication. Or if you are federating, then you plug it in uh, and integrate it there. And I know there's been demonstrations, you know, very early on between, uh, I know, Knock Knock Labs uh, FIDO authentication server and Ping's federation server. Um, and I believe there's going to be a lot more of, of discussion around that at the next big industry event, which will be Cloud Identity Summit uh, in La Jolla in June where that's where kind of the, the federation community tends to share news. So we might hear more about um, case studies or examples of how to do that. And again, I would refer you back to that FIDO dev list to have open community discussion around best practices for how to FIDO enable your federation infrastructure. Thank you. With on-device Authentication, is the FIDO client application exposed to application level attacks that sniff code level workflows and reverse engineers that flow to spoof the results? Yeah, so let's talk about implementation uh, and security. So everything I've said today has been about what FIDO is standardizing. Um, I did mention a bit about our certification program, which is how we test implementations. So I'll say more about that as a way of answering this question. Right now, the scope of our certification program is limited to what I call functional testing, meaning that we make sure the implementation uh, has correctly implemented FIDO and that a multiplicity of those implementations, when thrown together in a full matrix interoperability event, uh, they work together. They actually interoperate. Uh, if, you've, if you've had experience, you know that there are things outside of a standard that often can be uh, buggy for interoperability. So we're exercising both the, the implementation of the standard as well as the implementation of things the standard kind of assumes uh, or depends upon. That's functional testing. Full conformance testing, full interoperability testing. That's what we have today. In addition to that, our certification working group uh, has been working for quite some time uh, and continues to get closer and closer to rolling out something we call security testing. The security testing is going to be more lab-based for FIDO authenticators where uh, they will exercise how well are you protecting the private key locally 
from attacks like those referenced in the question. So right now, the best we have as a trade association is to have discussion about best practices, continue to work on some white papers, uh, continue to have educational events like this webinar or seminars. Um, but, uh, but soon, we'll have something new to add, which will be a whole new certification program to, uh, for an implementer to be able to go through and get third party validated that they are doing you know, industry best practices, or at least uh, industry best for the deployment scenario practices through third party lab testing and how well you're defending against those kinds of attacks. But in essence, what I, what I will say that goes slightly further is to give one case study. The way Samsung uh, deployed their support um, includes uh, a interface between the, the FIDO client software stack on the device and the fingerprint sensor authenticator um, that is very tightly, tightly coupled uh, with a secure interface. I believe they call it the SPY interface. Um, so that's something that is protected from malware attacks. In addition to that, they integrate with a trusted execution environment, um, which is also protected from uh, malware, frankly, any other application running in the rich OS. So for all the cryptographic signing and all the biometric management. So those are things that are being done in the wild. So we already have some best practices that exist. And we need to take that one step further and provide a program around it so that everyone has some patterns they can follow. And in the meantime, we, I refer you to that discussion forum. Great. Thanks, Brett. So we are at the top of the hour. Um, we no longer have any time for questions, so I'd like to close out this uh, webinar and thank everybody for participating as well as the panelists today. Thank you, Tasha, and thank you, David. Uh, and the Fight Alliance will do this. Uh, we'll continue to do a monthly series with different uh, co-presenters, so please uh, sign up to be notified, which you can do at our website, and you'll be notified not only of webinars but also presentations and when we're going to have speakers at conferences and the like. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.